Hello and welcome to this arcane spell casting guide for Baldur's Gate. I'll give a little introduction here and then I'll get into the topic of this first video, which is going to be level one arcane spells. By way of introduction, uh, I decided to do a guide like this, starting with arcane magic, the most powerful magic in Baldur's Gate after spending some time on Reddit and reading different people's thoughts on spells and also watching all of DeVeorn's spell guides that he has on YouTube, which are excellent. Go check out DeVeorn if you haven't already. If you enjoy listening to this, you'll definitely enjoy his take. On the perspective that I'm going to have on these different spells, I've been playing Baldur's Gate since I played the multi-pack CD version of the game back when I was about 12 or 13 years old. I took probably an eight year break after beating the game maybe once or twice at that time. And then I played in college, I played SOA and TOB and, and I basically played the game on and off ever since for years and years. I don't wanna say how many. Um, it's a beautiful game. It's a really deep game, it rewards repeat playthroughs and I also think that the D and D rule set also rewards getting really analytical and looking beyond spell descriptions and being creative about how different spells can be used. So that's what I'm going to try to do in this guide. I'm going to try to be very analytical. I'm going to try to go beyond the spell description. I'm going to try to use the game's rule set and math as much as possible to, to discuss different spells. And I'm also going to rate the spells. Um, Generally, I play solo, uh, so probably I'm going to be a little bit biased in how I rate spells. Maybe I, I rank spells that are useful when you're playing solo a bit a bit more highly, but I'm really trying to um, give a balanced view that also highlights what spells are useful in party play and how, because I, I think most people probably play um, with NPCs and, and party play. Also, I'm going to be talking about games in the base version, um, the enhanced edition of Baldur's Gate, SOA, and TOB. I'm going to be talking about spells from a complete saga perspective. So evaluating the util and rating spells based on how useful they are from the minute you start out in, in Candlekeep until you beat a Melisande at the very end of TOB. I do have a power gaming perspective. So there are a few exceptions where I might rate a spell a bit more highly just because it's fun uh, to play with, but that's pretty rare. Generally, this is all about power gaming. This is about what spells are going to make your character, your mage or sorcerer or arcane spellcaster more powerful and be able to defeat enemies most efficiently. And I think the last thing to say is that I'm going to be rating these spells, um, you know, normalized for the level. So obviously level one spells, a level one spell is never going to be good as any level nine spell on a just gross basis, on an absolute basis. But uh, I'm trying to normalize for what spell each spell level is at and give a rating that takes into account the spell level. On the rating system, I'll rate spells from one to ten, with ten being the absolute game-breaking spells, the elite of the elite spells that cause a huge power spike when you get access to them, the spells that being an arcane magic user is all about. There are not going to be spells like that at every level. There are only a handful in the entire game. And then, you know, going down the numbers, um, five is a decent spell that has limited uses through at least part of the saga. Two is a bad spell with extremely limited use cases that's clearly inferior to other options at the level. And then level one, just like level 10 is, is or rank one is, is just like rank 10 is, is some of the best spells in the game. Rank one is going to be one of the few worst spells in the entire game that I can't see any reason to ever use. Before I get going with the spells, I'm going to take them each alphabetically. Um, and I do want to say a few thanks. I already mentioned DeVeorn. Thanks to him for putting out an awesome 
spell guide of his own and giving me a lot of thoughts. Um, also, thanks to the creators of Near Infinity and the Baldur's Gate wiki, everybody who's contributed there. Those are both really useful tools as I as I went through and did this spell guide. So let's get going. We'll start out with level one. The first spell alphabetically is the armor spell. The spell has a duration of nine hours, a casting time of nine. The AOE or the target is only the casting arcane magic user. And I'll, I will read the description here. I'll read the descriptions generally when they're short, when they're long, I'll skim over, but this one's short. By means of this spell, the wizard creates a magical field of force that serves it as if it were scale mail armor, AC6. It is cumulative with dexterity bonuses to armor class and, in the case of fighter mages, with the shield bonus. The armor spell does not hinder movement, adds no weight or encumbrance, and does, doesn't prevent spell casting. It lasts until successfully dispelled or until its duration expires. So what is this spell? I think this spell, it's one of the first you can get access to in the game by scroll. Uh, there's there's a chest in the inn in Candlekeep that has an armor spell inside it. It's also, I think, a bit of a noob trap. Uh, the spell sounds like you should be using it a lot. It sounds like a spell that you need to have as a mage to magically protect yourself because you can't wear armor. And I think the game is telling you that a little bit by giving you the scroll even if it's in a locked chest, but inside the first floor of the first inn that you have access to. Now, why, why do I say it's a noob trap though? Um, that's because this spell is a bad spell that's inferior to um, another spell at the same level, the shield spell. And, and it's inferior in almost every way and all the ways that matter. And I'll sort of get into why that is as we talk through it. First, the basics, this thing lasts for nine hours in game time. So that's 45 minutes of real play time or 450 rounds. That's forever. Um, that's as long as it gets for for any spell in in Baldur's Gate. It's designed with the long cast time of nine. This takes almost an entire round to cast. And so it's designed really to be cast at the very beginning of the day when you wake up and then you never have to cast it again. In fact, since the default rest time in the game is eight hours, if you're not resting longer to, to heal up, it's eight hours. You can even cast this right before you go to sleep, wake up and still have an hour of in-game time during which the spell will be active. So you could theoretically do that if you wanted to save a spell slot the next day. Um, so this is definitely a pre-buff out of combat, something that's designed to be cast once and, and then not cast again. Now, why, why do I say that this spell is a noob trap and a spell that, that I, I never and never ever use? Well, the first reason is that you know, the basic effect, which is to set your, your base armor class to AC6, uh, becomes completely obsolete at latest by the time you can get an AC5 mage robe. And what that means is, uh, during BG1, it's when you can get the robe of the Archmagi, which is by far the best mage robe in BG1. It's the only one you should ever be wearing. And you can buy the robe of the good Archmagi or neutral Archmagi at, at High Hedge, uh, you know, one of the first merchants that you have access to in the entire game. You have access to it right from the beginning of BG1. And the evil version you can get from beating Deveoran and Cloakwood, so you have it even before Baldur's Gate. Since Robe of the Archmagi has an AC of 5, and the armor spell sets your AC to 6. Um, as soon as you can buy that, which is going to be pretty early in the game because it's a high priority item to buy, this becomes completely obsolete, has zero utility. So, you know, already there, you're sort of putting a ceiling on how you could possibly use this. The real reason, though, that this spell is, is something that I never take um, is because of the existence of the shield spell, which we'll get to later in, in level one. But you would think if, if you didn't study 
the details here, you would think that it's more important to cast armor on yourself than to cast shield on yourself. Because if you're a fighter, shield uh, armor generally has a bigger effect on your armor class because it reduces base armor class, whereas shields just add a bonus on top of that. And usually the reduction to your base is going to be far greater than the bonus that you're going to be able to achieve from a shield. So if you're a fighter, definitely having armor is way more important than having a shield. If you're a mage and you have access to these two level one spells, shield is actually better for protecting your armor class in every way than the armor spell. Um, shield sets your base AC to four. Plus it gives you a minus two bonus versus missile on top of that. So we'll compare that to armor. Armor gives you an AC of six. It's two worse. So you would never, if you're trying to lower your AC as much as possible, you would never ever cast armor ever. You always would cast shield on yourself. Um, also because shield has the base of four plus the bonus versus missile. Shield does have utility pass when you have the robe of the, of the Archmagi, whereas armor does not. The only way that you could say that, that armor is better than shield in any way is that armor has a longer duration, but shield's duration is very long as well. Um, and as a mage, especially early on in the game, you need a lot of spells. You don't have a big spell book. You're probably resting all the time. The nine hour length on this spell, which is the only thing you could say for it as compared to shield is really not useful. It's irrelevant. You're always going to be resting before nine hours is up. So on the whole, a bad spell, a spell that's sort of, um, you know, misnamed the name makes it seem important. It's not important. I'm rating this a two out of 10. The thing I do with this spell is I get the scroll in the inn and candle keep. I sell it for 50 GP and then I never mess with the armor spell in any way. I probably don't even learn it until, um, you know, very much later on in the game and filling out the, the mage book for fun. Two out of 10. It does something, but it's a bad spell. Next spell, blindness. This first level spell temporarily blinds its target. A saving throw is allowed. That's a save verse spell, by the way. A saving throw is allowed. And if successful, there are no harmful effects. If a victim is blinded, she receives a minus four penalty to her attack rolls and armor class. The casting time is two, and this is a single target spell, not AOE. So this is, this is a, a crowd control spell or a disable spell. Um, and it's not a horrible one, but I've read different places that I, I saw a spell guide somewhere, you know, in an ancient website online that was saying that blindness is one of the best spells in the game, which is just ridiculous. This is not a very strong spell. And I'll try to explain why I'm of that view. First of all, obviously there's a save, there's a save versus it, a save versus spell. It means a lot of the time you're going to cast this spell. It's going to do absolutely nothing for you. Um, and that's especially true as you get later on in the game. It does work on undead, um, but if you're talking about checking against magic resistance and checking against save versus spells, this spell is gonna do nothing a lot of the time. I'll give some examples. Let's take Tarnish, the very first mage that you run into in, at the Friendly Arm Inn with the scary horror spell that probably killed you multiple times um, if you're like me when you were a kid trying to play this game. Tarnish, has a save verse spell of 12. That means, you know, if, if Tarnish is rolling a D20 against your blindness spell, if that comes up 12 or greater, then Tarnish is saving. That means Tarnish has nine of 20 odds of saving or 45% odds. So about half the time, the first enemy that is a real threat individually that you meet in the game is gonna save versus this spell. And keep in mind, blindness is single target. That's another another problem with it. It's a single target spell. So you're really reserving this for enemies that pose some threat. Um, but those enemies are gonna say, even from very, very early in the game, those enemies are gonna save about half the time. 
and you're going to have wasted a spell, done nothing, and Tarnish is going to hit you with that horror anyway. As you get later on to tougher enemies that, that might stand out as the potential targets for this, the save versus spells make it even less useful. You know, Drizzt has an 80% save versus spell. Bodhi has an 80% save versus spell, not to mention their high magic resistance. So you're just not going to be able to get this off and have it succeed with any regularity against the type of high priority enemies you would want to target with it. Um, and it's single target. So it, being able to defend using this over magic missile to me is very, very hard. I'll take the guaranteed every time. If I was, if I was playing, you know, reload 500 times and hope that the fight goes well, then maybe this spell is better. Um, but that's not, how I try to play. I try to play for predictability and ne not having to reload. And that means that something that, that has a save versus spell to negate is not very helpful. On the positive side, just talk about what this spell does. The minus four penalty to attack rolls and armor class are nice, but the main effect of this, if you do hit it is that it lasts forever. So it lasts two hours, which is 10 minutes of real play time or a hundred rounds. That's forever in the conscious of combat. And the spell is going to limit the, the line of sight of your enemy. It's not really discussed in the description, um, but it limits the enemy's line of sight to a very tight line of sight. And enemies in this game do not share line of sight with other enemies. So a blinded enemy, if you're not within a few feet of that enemy, you know, right within melee range, that enemy can't see you at all, won't target you with ranged attacks, can't send spells at you, and is probably going to just stand on the battlefield and be confused because you're not going to be in its line of sight. So if you do hit it, if they do fail their save, it's debilitating. Um, definitely for enemies that are magic users or using ranged attacks. You can even run into their line of sight with melee, and if you have a low speed factor, get off the first attack, hit them, and then exit their line of sight before they can react and and the enemy will, uh, will just stand there confused despite the fact that they got hit by a melee attack. So this is, it's a very debilitating effect if the save is failed and it lasts forever. That's the what you can say that's positive about it. But look, in this game, if your enemies are failing save versus spell, or if you're hitting them with Malison and Doom, getting to a place, getting them to a place where they're reliably going to fail saves, there's all kinds of nasty stuff that you can do to them. You can outright kill them with Finger of Death later on. Um, you know, you can you can stun them, you can slow them. There's all kinds of things. You can put them in a web, which has a minus two penalty to save built in and stuns them. So there's a million things you can do to enemies that are going to fail save versus spell that include AOE and party friendly effects um, that, that are just better than, than blinding enemies. This does work on undead. Um, so you can say that about it. And one other clever thing you can do with this is you could cast it on yourself or on a party member uh, that's a thief to allow that thief to enter stealth uh, more easily during battle. Because the way that the accessibility of the stealth ability works during battle is the game checks to see whether the thief has any other enemies in his own or her own line of own line of sight you know not including party members so if you wanted to you could blind a thief in your party you still have good visibility because of your other party members but the thief because of the short line of sight is going to be able, be able to enter stealth easily even while other enemies are visible that is a potential use of this spell that sort of on the cheesy side and it's still very situational um so i'm reading this spell a three out of ten it is effective when you when you get it off um it's not a horrible spell but it's very situational and it really doesn't scale into mid soa or later because enemies are just going to save far too frequently and if you're debuffing them to the point where you could hit them with this you could do much nastier things this is not an amazing spell it's not horrible Three out of ten.
Next spell at level one is Burning Hands. This, this is going to be an interesting one. Probably, I'm probably hotter on this spell than, than many, many other people who I've heard uh, talk about it. So what does it do? The description is a little bit long, so I'll just sum it up. This is casting time of one. The area of effect is a five-foot cone with a 120-degree arc. And the spell does 1d3 points of fire damage, plus two points for each level of the caster, up to a maximum of 1d3 plus 20, so that's at level 10. Enemies who save for a spell will receive half damage. So this is a very small area of effect that actually changed, I think, in the latest versions of EE. Um, I've played lots of versions of Baldur's Gate, and in almost all of them, this spell is a single target spell. But that is not the case in the latest version of EE. And so I'm going to be talking about that version, which has this small area of effect, this five foot cone. You can probably get two to three enemies in there. I've tested it out. You're lucky if you get three, but it's pretty easy to get two enemies in there. That's, that's a major difference, this spell being AoE. It makes this spell the only AoE damage spell at level one and does give the spell a place in the game, um, which I'll, I'll get into. So I think the only way to assess this is to really compare it to your other damage option, the best damage option at level one, which is Magic Missile. Because if Magic Missile is a better spell in every way, then you're never gonna take Burning Hands and it becomes much worse. So let's just go through and really compare Burning Hands to the Magic Missile spell. So first of all, Magic Missile tops out at level nine with its five orbs. Burning Hands tops out at level 10. So they top out at similar levels. At level nine, Magic Missile sends five orbs that each do 1d4 plus one damage. So two to five da damage, that's magic damage. So a total of 10 to 25 damage to a single target and an average of 17.5 damage. Burning Hands maxed out, on the other hand, does 1d3 plus 20 fire damage per target, but a saving throw versus spell for half. So average damage without the save is 22, and average with the save is about 11 fire damage. So overall damage per target is probably lower than Magic Missile because saves will be made more than a third of the time, generally, especially later in the game. Generally, save versus spells are being made a third to a half of the time in, in BG1. So your overall damage per target is probably lower, um, but not by much. You know, you're probably looking at across a bunch of casts of this, of, of Burning Hands, with enemies with no fire resistance, you're looking at probably an average of doing about 15 to... Um, 16 damage per target or something like that. So if you can hit two or more targets with this thing, which is not that difficult to do if you're fighting groups of low level enemies, then burning the implication is that Burning Hands is going to do more damage than Magic Missile. And that's even if your enemies are making all their saves because Burning Hands is doing at, at least 11 damage even with the save. So if you hit two targets with that, that's 22 damage versus your average of 17.5 on a magic missile to one target. So, you know, this this right here just explains why Burning Hands has a place, I think. I would stock this over magic missile if I was going to fight the Zvart village or gnolls or groups of kobolds, um, you know, all those enemies are probably not going to make saves very often. They don't have fire resistances and it's easy. They come in big groups. So it's easy to get multiple in the blast radius and you'll actually, you'll be doing more damage than magic missile um, and probably killing, you know, multiples of those enemies in one go with this spell. Um, so, so that, that is, that is a scenario where burning hands is your best damage spell and a good spell at level one. I don't want to get too carried away though you know outside of that situation sort of in baldur's gate maybe very early soa where you're fighting groups of of enemies uh this spell really has very limited utility fire resistance of course is ex exceedingly common 
as compared to magic resistance on the magic missile. Magic missile also conducts multiple checks against magic resistance, which we'll get to later. Burning hands, you're only going to have one shot. If you're casting against a high, highly magic resistant enemy, you're probably not going to do any damage. Burning hands, you need to get close. You need to get within five feet. Um, and you probably don't want to do that when you're fighting later on in the saga against very powerful melee enemies. And then last, this is a really important factor that's really not in the description of the spell, um, but it distinguishes it from Magic Missile in a big way later in the game. When you cast Burning Hands, this is one of the few spells in the game that will actually freeze the wizard in place momentarily. It, it might be for one second um, while the spell is cast. And you know that, that makes you vulnerable to enemies closing on, on your wizard and attacking you in melee. But the bigger deal is that that makes this spell impossible to cast um, in, in late SOA or TOB where your optimal strategy as an arcane magic user is you're wearing Amulet of Power, you're wearing Robe of Vecna, and you're using Improved Alacrity, alacrity and the reduction in spell casting time to cast um you know 30 40 50 spells in a single round and empty out your spell book if you're if you're doing that later in the game which is your optimal strategy then there's no way you would ever take burning hands over magic missile because that freeze for one second which magic missile does not suffer from is going to prevent you from casting um other spells that would have a cast time of zero with the reduction and you could probably fit 10 or 20 spells in that one second freeze when you're using that strategy. So, um, you know, Burning Hands, you're never going to use it once you get to later in the saga for many different reasons. And this freeze is, is one of them. Overall, uh, I rate this, a this spell a 5 out of 10. Um, it is the second best damage dealing spell at level 1. The second best um, you know offensive damage dealing spell at level one in my view i could see taking it over magic missile against you know clumps of low level enemies in bg1 but there's really no scalability so that's going to limit this to a five out of ten which is a, on my scale is a, is a decent spell that has limited uses through at least part of the saga so that part would be bg1 here but this is not a bad spell Next spell, Charm Person. So this spell is a duration of five rounds. Um, the, the area of effect is one person, so anybody can be targeted with this, party member or non-party member, enemy. This spell is the first Charm spell in the game, and enemies have a plus three bonus to save against it. So you compare that to, as an Arcane Magic user, you get... Dire Charm at level 3 with no save uh, penalty or bonus. And then you get Domination at level 5, which has a minus 2 penalty to save and lasts 8 rounds instead of 5. So that's sort of the progression of Charm spells as an Arcane Magic user. And it starts with this one at level 1. I, I'm just going to talk about Charm spells in general for a second. They're all sort of similar, and they all suck. Um, you know, obviously, there must be some place for charm spells in in D, D lore because there's a hell of a lot of them in this game and they all suck um the use cases are very limited i think the issues are that uh that that enemies that would be very powerful to charm naturally are going to have high resistances or um have very high save versus spells and there's also many many enemies that are completely immune to charm effects um, undead are immune to it uh, later in the game you know by mid SOA or later any tough enemies that you face almost all of them are going to be wearing helms of charm protection have high magic res have high saves um, or just you know have status permanent status effects that they're immune to charge to charm so you know charm as a as a general matter um, it seems like it's most, from a power gaming perspective, it seems like it's mostly in this game, not 
to be used, but because it's part of the lore of of the BG world and D and D lore, and that's sort of reflected in how the developers went about this spell. There's some Easter eggs buried where if you charm certain people, like the guy at the bottom of Colquitt Mines, or um, or I think uh, Regifast, the mage in in Baldur's Gate, the city of Baldur's Gate, they'll have different dialogues with you while charmed. Um, but you know, aside from unlocking those Easter eggs, there's almost no use for these spells in my view in in the entire game i'll mention two uses one of them i don't use because i tend to play solo the other one i do um so the first one is that and Deve, i got i got this off of deveor and, and i've seen him use it on his stream um if if one of your party members has been charmed you can use this spell to charm the party member back so i think the main use case for that is when fighting sirens in bg1 so that is a, that is creative. Uh, I never thought of using charm defensively in that way, but it's very situational. You know, there are very few enemies in the entire game that use charm, and past the early stages of BG One, you're just going to be better off using using items to protect you from charm spells. Um, you know, minor globe, uh, the green stone amulet, potions. Um, or Helms of Charm Protection. There are many different things that that will protect you from charm effects once you get past, you know, early BG1. But charming, charming defensively, charming back your party is is creative. I thought that was cool when I saw it. That is a potential use. Um, and then the other the other use, which is the only time I ever use this spell ever in my runs, is to get the the cloak of Balduron off of Quenash in the Underseller. Uh, you can of course just kill her, but that um, that causes a big minus rep. Um, you can also do a saga, which just takes too long. The cloak is too powerful. I always want it right away when I get to Baldur's Gate. Or you could pickpocket her, but a lot of times I'm playing solo and I'm not playing a mage thief, so pickpocketing is is um, is not possible. Um, or if if it is possible, it's it's low probability because I'm doing it by a familiar, which I'll get to later. The, the sort of the, the other door to go through to get the cloak without suffering the rep loss is you can charm Quenash and then have her attack a guard in the Underseller and the guard will kill her, thus allowing you to pick up the cloak. So that's when I use this spell. It's the only time in the entire saga that I ever use any charm spell because they're just not very good. Um, it's another spell that, especially at level one, this one, Charm Person, the, the base version, where there's a plus three to save versus spells. It's just a spell that that most of the time is going to have zero effect. And there's no time for that when you're in combat to cast stuff that has zero effect. So I'm going to rate this a two out of ten. Bad spell. Uh, basically never use it aside from that one non-combat use to get the Cloak of Balderon. Next spell is Chill Touch. Chill Touch, uh, a joke spell. I'll, I'll get into why it's a joke spell. Um, I'll read the description here since it's short. When the caster completes this spell, a blue glow encompasses her hand. This energy attacks the life force of any living creature Upon which the wizard makes a successful melee attack. Non-living creatures such as golems and undead are unaffected by this spell. If the creature is punched for 1d2 fist damage, strength bonuses apply, and must make a saving throw versus spell, or suffer 1d8 points of damage and receive a minus two thacko penalty for five rounds. Wow. Uh, the duration is one turn, so you get ten rounds of having this spell up. And it affects the the caster by placing a magical weapon that looks like a blue palm in the caster's main hand. So I'll just talk for a second about magical weapon and touch spells generally in Baldur's Gate. In general, they're going to suck. Um, all of them suck except for Black Blade of Disaster, which we'll get to later. 
Um, the reason that they suck is because the spell is going to immediately replace your main hand weapon with um, whatever the magical weapon or touch attack is that you just created. And as we all know, by the time you get to SOA, certainly um, you're getting a huge amount of buffs uh, and great status effects from, from your main hand weapon. You're getting regen, you're getting damage reduction, you're getting AC reduction, um, you're getting magic resistance. All that goes away the second that you cast one of these types of spells on yourself. Also, this also changes you from attacking with whatever that weapon was, which probably had some Thacko bonuses on it, to attacking with your fist. And uh, that means that you're losing whatever proficiencies, or, or if you're a fighter mage, you're losing your specialization in your main hand weapon, and your damage and your Thacko and your attacks per round are going down because you're, for touch spells, at least you're replacing a weapon inside your proficiency with a fist. Not good. So, I mean, right off the bat, it, even setting aside what this thing actually does, you immediately nerf yourself in a major way by casting this. On top of that, you know, this, it, the real, the, the multiple reasons this particular touch spell, chill touch is a, is a complete joke. One of the worst spells in the game, uh, you're attacking with your fist, you do 1d2 fist damage, strength bonuses apply. The spell description says that like it's like it's something special. That's just the regular fist attack. Your strength bonuses apply to your fist attack to begin with. So that's nothing. All the spell does is add this 1d8 points of, of cold damage and a minus 2 Thacko penalty for 5 rounds whoop de doo And those effects only occur if you make your attack which you probably only have one of per round because you're a mage and the enemy fails a saving throw versus spell. So it's, it's multiple hoops to jump through just to get to the promised land of 1d8 cold damage and a minus two Thacko penalty, i.e. way worse than a magic missile would get you. And you have to be in melee the whole time to even have a chance of getting this off. So just horrible, a horrible spell. Uh, because the fist damage is just regular fist damage, it's still non-lethal, by the way. So you're relying on the fit. When you have this up, if you're solo, you're relying on the fail versus save to actually kill anybody. Because the fist will just beat up their unconscious body and, and deal non-lethal damage. So you actually need the fail versus save to actually finish off an enemy. And I think that the sort of the coup de grace for, for this... Uh, this spell being horrible and one of the worst in the game is that it does cold damage. So it's actually possible to overkill enemies if the 1d8 rolls high and it's a low hit point enemy. You can actually freeze them and, and lose access to their items. Probably rare because it would need to be a low HD enemy. But, you know, that's just... I, I was testing this out, killing gnolls, and one in every five or something... When I did finally kill it, I wouldn't even get the gold from it. Horrible. Horrible spell. And I'll probably spend less time on, on touch spells and magic weapon spells later on. But I wanted to explain why they prob they're all horrible. Um, this one is particularly bad. 1 out of 10, one of the worst spells in the entire game. Next up, Chromatic Orb. A highly overrated spell. Um, you know, Deveorn makes the same point, um, but he's correct. This spell is highly overrated. Uh, I'll just go over what it does first. The description is long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But to summarize, what Chromatic Orb does is it has two components. It deals some guaranteed damage which maxes out at 2d8 acid damage at 12th level to a single target. It's a single target spell. And then there's also a effect, uh, a negative effect on the enemy that's separate from the damage. And that effect is only going to occur if the enemy saves versus, if the enemy fails a save versus spell with a plus six bonus. So 
I think the way to look at this spell is it's almost it's almost in the territory of being a wild mage and hoping for positive wild surges. You're getting this guaranteed damage, which which is nothing to write home about. It's always less than magic missile. And then you're getting an effect which can be very powerful for level one. At 12, a 12th 12 level mage casting this, uh, and you do get scalability here because the effect gets worse for enemies over time, which is nice. But a 12th level mage casting this, uh, the effect is to instantly kill the victim. So, you know, that's 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 amazing to have a level one spell that theoretically uh, can, can one shot kill enemies um, or it seems amazing. But the plus six bonus to saves really means that this is a very low probability event. And so I think if you're power gaming, if, if you're reloading 50 times and trying to make a video or a post for online about how you killed Irenicus with chromatic orb or whatever, you killed Furkrag with chromatic orb, like go ahead, reload 500 times or cast a ton of debuffs so you have a greater chance of this landing. And instead of just using finger of death or another spell that's very nasty that doesn't have the plus six bonus, like you, you, you intentionally use this spell because you want to use a level one spell, you know, go ahead. You can do that. You probably still need to reload a few times. Um, that's that's not the, the best way to play the game. Try to do that against tough enemies. A lot of times you're going to die because you spent three rounds trying to set up a level one spell when you could have been doing much more powerful things with your mage um like time stops or horde wiltings or anything um so you know the effect is powerful uh it is of interest that that the spell is level one and can cause an instant death but you're really rolling the dice and to put in perspective how significant the plus the plus six bonus is Let's look at some enemies from from BG1, which generally are going to have the lowest, um, the, the worst uh, save versus spell, right? They're going to have the highest save versus spell. They're going to have um, the the lowest chance of surviving this. An ogre berserker, for example, has a ten base save versus spell. So with a plus six bonus, that becomes saving on a four or better. So the effect is only working on a one, two, or three on a D20. That's 15% of the time. Okay, so you expect to cast this thing like six times just to kill an Ogre Berserker with the death effect. Obviously, you could have just cast two or three magic missiles in that time and and got the kill that way. Um, Deveorn, the the teleporting mage at the bottom of Candlekeep, for example, he has a five save verse spell, and that's very common for, for tough enemies. In, in even in Baldur's Gate 1, throughout all of SOA as well, is to have a five save for a spell. So with a plus six bonus, Deveorn is saving against these effects 100% of the time. You have to ha actually cast a debuff like Malison or Doom, etc., to have any chance of the status effect landing. I think that just sums up why this spell is overrated. The effect doesn't really hit that often. And if you're trying to deal damage, inside level one you're taking magic missile over this i'm rating this a four out of ten. Four out of ten there is a fun factor um there is a fun factor to to casting this inside improve, improved alacrity and insta killing the entire screen uh, of low level enemies that's definitely fun um, but that's not power gaming the fact that you have an instant kill effect from a level one spell is cool I think that merits taking it to a four, um, especially because you do get some minimum damage here, but this is not a great spell. It's very random. So four out of 10, I almost never use it. I usually um, just fill up on magic missile instead because this is def definitely inferior to magic missile as a spell. So that's chromatic orb. Next spell, color spray. This is a spell with a casting time of one, so meant to be cast in combat. The area of effect is a 90 degree arc, extending out in front of the mage casting it. And the description is short, so I'll read it. Upon casting this spell, the wizard causes a vivid fan-shaped spray of clashing colors 
to spring forth from her hand. 1d6 creatures within the area are affected in order of increasing distance from the wizard. All creatures in the area of effect that have 4 hit dice or less must make a saving throw or be rendered unconscious for 5 rounds. So let's, let's talk about this. First of all, crowd control spells or disables. I probably underrate them versus the average player, but I just don't think they're that strong. Um, you're usually introducing a save versus spell, and you're oftentimes not getting closer to your ultimate goal, which is just to kill the enemies. So I think it's just difficult in general to take crowd control spells versus damage spells. Uh, you know, if you play in a party with a bunch of fighters, obviously crowd control spells become much more powerful and your views may differ. But I probably, uh, you know, I'm pretty negative on crowd control spells as opposed to damage overall. That said, color spray is a decent spell. And I want to address one thing in particular. You know, this evaluating this spell is really all about comparing it to sleep because they're both level one spells. They're the two best level one crowd control spells, and they both have the same effect on enemies if successful, which is that they make enemies become unconscious, during which time every hit, every attack against those enemies hits. So they're very similar spells, color spray and sleep. They're in different schools. So if you're a specialist mage, that could impact or force you into choosing one or the other. Um, but they're similar spells and at the same level. So what that means is that, you know, no matter how good these things are on an absolute basis, if one or the other is worse relatively, then that's the spell that's relatively worse is, is immediately just going to become a bad spell because you'd always take the better one in the same level. So let's compare this to sleep. I think overall, the, I'll go through each way in which this spell, um, could be evaluated against sleep and sort of decide which is better and talk through and explain which is better. Um, I think overall, I, what I read is that everybody has the conclusion that sleep is this great spell and is, is a pretty damn good spell at level one and color spray is clearly inferior. And I'm not sure it's so clear. I'm just not so sure it's so clear. I do think sleep is better, but I think it's very close and I'll step through why. So first, the first way you could compare these two spells is to look at um, the odds of saving for enemies and sleep is a saving throw versus death with a minus three penalty. Whereas color spray is a save versus spell without any penalty. I think right off the bat, it's easy to read that minus three penalty in the sleep description and say, well, sleep's obviously better minus three penalty, obviously better, but Let's look a bit closer at how these things work. Saves for versus death, generally enemies make them more easily. They have a greater chance to make them than saves versus spell. I think that's because you know your save versus death is, is your save to avoid very nasty things like instant kills, like finger of death. Save versus spell is a much broader, uh, much broader type of saving throw. So I, I, I checked on various different enemies that are that are 4 HD or less that you might see early on in the game to evaluate um, you know, how this compares between sleeps versus death with minus three penalty and color spray versus spell without any penalty or bonus. Let's look at it. All right, a Zvart, a Zvart, okay? Spell save 17, death save 14. So if you add the three penalty onto the death save, 14 plus three is 17. That's exactly the same as the save versus spell. That means your odds of sleeping as Vart with color spray and sleep are exactly the same. Ogre Berserker, spell save 10, death save seven. It's the same thing. There's a spread of three, so your odds are the same here. Spider, spell save 17, death save 14. It's the same. Kobold, spell 19, death 16, also a three difference. Ankeg, spell 13, death 10, also a three, a three pip difference. So, you know, there's a theme here. I don't know if it holds for every creature, but generally speaking, saves versus death are three pips easier to make or 15% easier to make on a d20 versus 
saves versus spell. And that means that color spray and sleep are exactly the same when it comes to odds to sleep a particular enemy. Exactly the same, no difference. All right, so that's a push. Um, even though on the surface, it looks like sleep is much better on that front, it's actually a push, it's the same. Okay, next. Both spells only affect four HD creatures or below. That's exactly the same. Generally, that means level one to four enemies. And, you know, clearly that means that this, that color spray has zero scalability until later in the game. Purely a BG1 and even an early BG1 spell, zero scalability. Uh, sleep lasts for five rounds per level, whereas color spray lasts for five rounds, period. So sleep is definitely better on that front. Although, I'll say five rounds is actually a very long time, especially if you're in party combat where you have, um, you know, you could be getting off uh, 20. It's easy, even in early BG1, you could be getting off 10 attacks per round across your party um, or to 15 attacks per round across your party. Five rounds is a long time. So uh, especially when every attack is hitting, right? Um, so, you no, know, it's better for sleep five rounds per level can get extremely long in the context of, of BG combat. Color spray is only five. Sleep is a little bit better, but marginally so. Um, next factor, color spray, like Burning Hands, is one of these spells that freezes the mage momentarily upon casting it. Sleep does not do that. So that's another edge for sleep, especially when you're using this for crowd control, you're probably trying to keep enemies away from your mage um, the fact that you have to be frozen while casting color spray for even that split second is a disadvantage. So sleep's a little better there too. The next factor is this point about being limited to 1d6 creatures. You know, there's no such limitation on the sleep spell, um, but the description says right here that, that color spray is limited to 1d6 creatures. This as far as I can tell, does not exist. This is not a real thing. It's in the description, but it's not actually in the game. I've tested it many times. Um, there, there's many, many times when I was able to sleep much more than six creatures with a color spray spell. Um, so as far as I can tell, this does not exist. Uh, it's just a push. Both of these things can freeze or sleep an unlimited number of creatures, as long as they're in the AoE. Next way to assess these two. Um, let's look at the AOE. So sleep is a 15 foot radius, a circle, and color spray is an arc emanating out from the wizard. I think they're similar because it's a very big arc. I think the overall AOE is similar, but it's easier, it's easier use case and easier to target the sleep spell. You can throw it out from range. You don't have to be um, facing a certain direction and you know, sleep, you can just click into the center of a bunch of enemies and, and launch it. Whereas color spray, you have to sort of situate yourself uh, on the field of battle first. So that's a minor advantage for sleep. The status effect is the same, right? Unconscious enemies are always gonna get hit. They're not gonna get up off the ground and be able to cast spells or attack you. So that's the same for both of these spells. And it's a powerful state to put enemies into, obviously. It's just like a stun. Now the last factor on which you could compare these two spells, color spray or sleep, is whether they're party friendly. And this is a really important difference between the two, the most important. Sleep is party friendly. You can cast it on a big area, including enemies and your party, and the enemies will have to save versus it if they're four HD or below. And your party, on the other hand, um, will not have to. Sleep is party friendly. Color spray is not party friendly. Color spray, you can put, if you're at a low level, which you're gonna be when you're casting this thing, um, you can put your own party to sleep with color spray. So that that makes um, sleep just much better. That's, that's really the deciding factor to me. It's the party friendliness, not the saves thing, not any of this other stuff, um, but the party friendliness of sleep just makes it better. In light of all that, um, you know, color spray, it's it's one of the two best crowd control spells in level one, but uh, but it's inferior to sleep and it has the same effect 
because of this party friendliness issue and a couple other minor things. So I can't really see I can't really see ever taking it. You would have to not have had access to the sleep scroll yet or be a specialist mage. Um, so I'm rating this a three out of ten. Not a bad spell, but it's just overshadowed by sleep, which, as we'll get to later, I don't think the world of either. Um, but it is clearly better than color spray, although not for the reasons that that you might think. And we're on to the next spell, Find Familiar. One of the most complex level one spells, given that most of them are pretty simple, uh, and also one of the best. So this spell, I'm not gonna read the description because uh, the description is very long and it goes through each of the different creatures that can be summoned depending on the alignment of the caster of this spell but it'll be up on the screen and i'm glad in in latest versions of bg they actually give you the stats for each of the creatures that you can summon right here in the spell description which i think is cool i don't, I don't think that existed in every in every version of this game but it's in here now which is very helpful so this spell uh it really it really has two effects it has two effects that are totally separate and they're each important the first one, or one, one is more important than the other, uh, depending on your alignment. But the first one, which I think is probably more important actually, is that the spell adds an amount of HP to your arcane magic caster equal to half of the HP of the summoned familiar. So that's four to six HP. That's effect one. Effect two is that the spell summons a creature. And I'll talk about the different familiars that can be summoned. I'll go through each of them and in a little bit here and discuss whether they're any good, which ones are the best, and therefore, if you're power gaming, what your alignment should be as a mage. I'll get to that in a minute. But let's just talk about the HP edition. And first of all, anybody who can use a fine familiar scroll can get the benefit of this. So one of the first things that I do on any thief upon getting the use any item HLA is to have a, a find familiar scroll saved up and have that thief cast it because thieves can have familiars if they can cast the spell off the scroll and get that get the familiar and the HP bump. Um, but for mages, uh, that HP bump is is a really useful buff. Uh, you get it, you know, you, you get it from the moment that you first cast this spell. It, it, it increases your max HP, and you're going to keep that benefit all the way through the end of TOB. And 4 to 6 HP, uh, first of all, you know, it's always nice to have more hit points. It can always save your life to have extra hit points all the way through TOB. So this is a level 1 spell that has utility through the entire saga. Probably the first one that we've discussed in this whole walkthrough that has utility through the whole saga. Um, and when you're at very low levels, uh, the spell adding four to six HP, that's going to add something like 50% to your HP. I mean, that's very huge. If you're trying to play a no reload run, as I try to do um, very early on, that's that four to six HP is probably the difference between dying and being able to run away from an enemy very frequently when you're a, a uh, a very low level mage and you have you might have a total of 12 hp before you cast this spell so that hp bonus is useful throughout the saga and it's very useful when you're at very low levels to avoid dying right away right when you start the game uh, for that reason i take this spell every time as one of my character creation screen spells at level one the scroll the first scroll that you can get access to is from is a drop from nimble the assassin that you meet after you do the national mines you cannot buy this at high hedge and therefore you're going to have a pretty big gap of at least a few levels between the beginning of the game and when you can actually cast this off a scroll having those extra four to six hp is most useful in that gap it's huge in that gap it'll save your life uh they're, they're good odds it'll save your life so I, I always choose this on the character creation screen, along with protection from petrification, by the way. Um, and that's because there's a magic missile scroll 
inside candle keep that you can pick up. Um, so those are my starting two, but the most important one is, is find familiar for that, that hit dice bonus. So I think even if you totally forget about the rest of, of this spell, forget about all the creatures it creates, you have the ability to put all those creatures in your pack and never let them out. So, you know, you could think of this spell as just an HP buffing spell. Even if you only think about it that way, this is a great spell. It's one of the best level one spells um, already. And then to add in the creature just adds a little bit extra. So let's talk about, let's let's get into the, the creatures now. Um, I think, I think first of all, let's think about, you know, when you're going to want to have these things out of your pack. Um, I think part of that depends on the effect of, of them, of the creature dying. If the, if the familiar dies, the mage loses permanently one point of constitution and the mage also loses the bonus HP from the familiar. The bonus HP is regainable if you were to cast the spell again, but the point of constitution you could never regain, except through tomes or the machine of Lum the Mad or other ways that you can that you can you know, gain um, stat bonuses in the game. So let's let's think about this this constitution penalty. For me, power gaming, I always use charisma as my dump stat as a mage. Strength is useful no matter what class you are. It's very useful for lower Thacko and, and better melee attacks. Especially if you're soloing, you want to be able to have the option to, to melee as a, even as a mage. Um, dexterity helps your armor class, which is very helpful early on. And your Thacko on, on ranged attacks, which, is, which can be helpful. Uh, so that's not a dump stat for mages. Intelligence is definitely not a dump stat for mages. You want... Um, you want versatility and you want high chances of memorizing scrolls. Um, wisdom, you can take down to 14 because you can pick up four points of wisdom by the time you're in TOB and needing to use the wish spell. Um, so I think you can take wisdom to 14, 15 and be fine. Uh, and, and, you know, with having charisma as an option for a dump stat, that means that usually I have enough points where I'm taking constitution to 15 or 16 to get plus one or plus two level per HP per level extra. If you're a mage and you're a pure mage, then being over 16 constitution does nothing for you. Uh, being under 15 constitution all the way down to six constitution, it's all the same. You know, seven constitution up to 14, you're just getting no bonus per on HP per level. There's no difference. I think it might affect how quickly you fatigue, but you know, from a power gaming practical perspective, there's no difference from seven to, to 14. Um, but I usually try to get my con to 15 or 16 to pick up the extra HP. And in that event, losing a familiar is pretty brutal. Um, if you're at 15, 16, if, if you're not, if you, if you didn't roll high enough or you're not playing with 15, 16, then your risk is a lot lower. How you're going to use the familiar is going to, is going to change drastically because if you're at, at 14 con and you already used the tome in BG one, so you know, you're maxing at 14 for almost the entire saga, um, then you could, you have, you have, uh, seven points of constitution to give. Um, only upon giving this, the, the eighth point to move down to six constitution, do you actually start to lose HP? So if you're at 14 con, then you can be a bit riskier with the familiar. If you're at 15, 16, then having your familiar die is going to be pretty, pretty brutal. Um, it equals permanently losing one HP per level that you're at through the earlier levels of the game. So if you move uh if you and i think that bonus applies through every level actually the plus one bonus per level to hit points 
may apply through every level. Sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. But in any event, you're losing something like, you know, 10 to, to 20 different, 10 to 20 HP when you're moving through the 15 to 16 con range, even as a mage permanently. So that's, that's just a brutal effect. Um, that has to that ha that means you have to be really careful with your with your familiar if you're power gaming with a mage, which probably means you have 16 constitution. You have to be careful. It's, it is costly. With that in mind, um, let's talk about the different familiars. Which one of them are good? Which ones are weak and should never make it out of your pack? And the basic question I'm gonna answer here is do you ever want to take the familiar out of your pack and i'm assuming you're playing with 15 16 con these these familiars are bad enough they're weak enough that the basic question is do you ever want to let them out um is it ever worth the risk you know these things have 12 hit points at maximum that means that one hit they're a one hit kill for many many enemies so it's a basic question do you ever want to let the familiar out let's go through all right, I'll start with the goody two-shoes. Lawful good and neutral good. You get the same familiar. You get the pseudo dragon as your familiar. This is a horrible familiar. You never want to let this thing out of your pack. Uh, maybe against basilisks, they have some place if you can keep them in range because they have immunity from petrification, so they won't be affected by the basilisk's ranged attack. But even then... If you get into melee or a Tazloy runs onto the screen, anybody could one-hit this thing. Um, and given that Blur is the special ability of this familiar, which is a combat ability, there's really no situational use case. I mean, you're not going to take this thing out of your pack to have it cast Blur on itself, then put it back in there. And you're also not going to send it into battle with 12 HP, two attacks per round with a 15 Thacko for 1d3 damage. It's just horrible. It's a horrible fighter. Uh, you're not going to send it into battle with or without blur. It's not worth risking the constitution. You're never letting this thing out of your pack. Okay. No. Bad familiar. Never let it out of your pack if you insist on playing these alignments. Next. Lawful neutral. So the lawful neutral familiar is the ferret. The ferret distinguishes itself because it has 50% in pickpockets. So that's the best. There's one other familiar, the cat, chaotic neutral familiar that has pickpocket skills, um, but its skills are only 15%. This familiar's pickpocket skills are 50%, five zero. That's good enough to pickpocket um, you know, many, different, many different items in the game. Uh, so situationally, especially if you're not worried about, about suffering minus rep or having people turn hostile, hostile if you fail, this could be useful, not in combat, never in combat, but you let this thing out um, and you, you see if you can pickpocket the Cloak of Aldran or um, Aldranon's Cloak. Um, you can also do some cheeses with this, I think, in, in BG2, you know, certain items like the rod that you get in the Beholder quest that you're not supposed to be able to take out of certain areas. I think you can have your familiar, the ferret, pickpocket them and then just not collect the item out of inventory until you leave the area, um, out of your familiar's inventory through dialogue until you leave the area. So th this familiar, the basic answer as to whether you ever let the ferret out of your pack is yes, situationally, you're gonna want that 50% pickpocketing, especially if you're playing a solo, which is what I'm really thinking about here. Um, even if you're not, other thieving skills are much more useful for the thieves early on in the game. So for the thieves in your party. Um, so this this familiar does situationally have a reason to come out of your pot, your pack. Never in combat, but it's giving you something, right? In addition to the HP. Okay, that's the ferret. Next up, lawful evil. This familiar is by far and away the best familiar. I think it's the only good one. And the existence of this familiar um, and its special ability is the reason that I choose Lawful Evil every time when I'm playing as an arcane magic user. So why why is this familiar so good? Well, 
Uh, it has 100% elemental immunities in its default form. And this is the, um, the imp. It has 100% resistance to fire, cold, and electricity in its default form. So that's that could be situationally good, I guess. You could try to trip a, a fireball trap or something, and you know that that the the familiar is not going to die. But with nine with nine hit points, um, you probably don't want to let let the familiar out of your pack for that purpose. Uh, the real reason that that the lawful evil familiar is is good is because its special ability or its spell it's can, that it can cast is polymorph self. And Polymorph Self allows the imp to transform itself into a variety of different forms, each of which is better than any of the other familiars are. Uh, and the best of those forms, I think by far, is a mustard jelly. So this this familiar can transform itself into a mustard jelly for long enough to, to last a fight or a couple fights. Why is mustard jelly so good? Well, mustard jelly is immune to normal weapons and has 125% magic resistance, as well as a lot of other resistances. And since familiars have their own line of sight, you know, they're not like other summons, um, they can see for themselves. You can, in the early stages of BG1, if you choose this on your character selection screen, if you choose find familiar and your lawful evil, you can polymorph into a mustard jelly, have your mage, and I do this pretty frequently to pick up XP when at very low levels, you can have your mage just sit in the corner of the map and you can go around the entire map and in a lot of areas in BG1, especially early BG1, you can clear the entire area as a polymorphed imp into a mustard jelly simply because of the immunity to normal weapons and the magic resistance. That is amazingly powerful to have access to uh, in early BG1 when almost all enemies are either using magic or they have normal normal weapons. You do have to be careful with duration. The second that the polymorph self uh, spell duration ends, the imp is going to transform back into its impish self with nine hit points and can be killed immediately. So you cannot be in combat when that occurs. But this ability to cruise around as a mustard jelly and fight enemies who have no chance of damaging you while your mage sits across the map is just extremely, extremely powerful early on in the game. So this, this familiar is a very strong familiar. Um, if you get to later on in, you know, by mid SOA, you have enemies using magic weapons even by late bg1 you have enemies using magic weapons and this and and you know your, your familiar is probably going to die even as a mustard jelly uh, unless you're facing exclusively magic users um but look by that time end of bg1 none of the other all the other familiars needed to stay in the pack much earlier there's no familiar that wants to be out by late bg1 anyway so on a relative basis you know this this lawful e evil um, familiar the imp is is by by far the, the best and it's a very powerful ally to have as a mustard jelly at level one I'll probably go on for another 10 minutes about how broken this is <laughs> uh, the mustard jelly form but I'll move on you know in short th this is this is um, this is awesome and in addition to the HP you know th the existence of this familiar really is what makes this spell great all right let's go through the rest of the familiars Next is True Neutral. True Neutral gets a rabbit. The rabbit has, it does have some thieving skills, 40% um, in fine traps, and it has 75% elemental resistance. But with 12 hit points, you're not going to be relying on that resistance to save yourself. The attack, you know, like for all these familiars, the attack abilities are horrible. Two attacks per round, 15 DACA, 1d2 damage per attack. It's nothing. Um, the only reason you would ever even think about using this would be to detect traps with the 40% find in traps. Um, but you're going to have thieves very early on that have higher find traps than that. Uh, and I, I don't think you even want a chance letting this thing out of your pack to, to try to 
find a trap um, inside a dungeon where it could be killed by an enemy. Not to mention, if you're soloing, the rabbit might be able to see the trap, but um, you're not going to be actually be able to disable it without without the without the other thieving skills. So, does this does this familiar ever need to come out of your pack? The true neutral rabbit? No, it doesn't. Neutral evil. Neutral evil uh, can cast d glass dust twice per day. That merely causes a 4 AC penalty and a 2 Thacko penalty to your enemies. And there's a save versus breath against it. Very weak ability. And this thing has 12 HP and has 2 attacks around for 1d2 damage each. You're never letting this thing out of your pack. It has 100% fire resistance. I guess you could try to trip a fireball trap with it. Um, you know, maybe then. But again, the idea of taking out a familiar when you're going to lose... 10 to 20 HP permanently if it dies in a dungeon is is not a good idea uh, outside from the polymorphed imp. So neutral evil, you're not taking it out of your pack. Chaotic good. Chaotic good, you're again not taking it out of your pack. This, this probably is the worst familiar. Um, there's very little you can say for it given that it's a very weak fighter, but it's but its special ability is a is a combat ability, you know, mirror image that's designed to be used to go into battle. Um, you still are doing you're doing two attacks per round for one d two damage. You're never lighting this thing out of your pack. You're never fighting with it. Chaotic neutral, same answer. You have fifteen percent pickpockets, but if you wanted pickpocketing, you should clearly just go lawful neutral and take the ferret kind of ironic that that the best pickpocketing familiar is lawful right it doesn't make any sense but that's the way it is chaotic neutral cat you're, you're not taking out of your pack and then chaotic evil the quasit um it has the horror ability you still are not taking this thing out of your pack to cast horror in my view um risking it getting one shot at 12 hit points I guess it does 1d6 damage per attack, uh, and it has the elemental resistances. You're still just never letting this thing out. It's too risky. The benefits aren't there. So, you know, to sum up, I think most of these familiars, you sort of, if you're power gaming and you're trying to preserve your constitution, you're not going to ever let them out of your pack from the moment that you cast the spell in the very beginning of the game. And then you're just getting the HP boost. Uh, the lawful evil, the lawful neutral one, you might want to pickpocket with. And lawful evil is a whole nother story. The imp is very powerful with its polymorph mustard jelly form. And even some of the other forms are, are decent on the polymorph. That was a lot about Find Familiar. This spell is an 8 out of 10. I think even if the lawful evil familiar did not exist, this would probably be a 7 out of 10. Uh, or six at worst because the HP bonus is just such a nice buff to have. But the existence of that lawful evil familiar is very powerful. Eight out of 10 spell, the best spell so far in level one. Next alphabetically is friends. Friends lasts for 1d4 rounds plus one round per level. The area of effect is the caster, so it can only affect the caster. You can't cast it on other party members. A friend's spell caused the wizard, causes the wizard to temporarily gain six points of charisma. Those who view the caster tend to be very impressed with her and make an effort to be her friend and help her as appropriate to the situation. Officious bureaucrats might decide to become helpful. Surly gate guards might wax informative blah 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 it just increases your charisma it adds six to your charisma that's all this does and i think this is really all about buying things um there's some there's seldom few interactions in the entire saga where it helps to have 18 plus charisma uh, there are two right in the beginning of the game you can get the nobleman in the inn to put some gems upstairs 
and, but you can only access those if you if you have uh, 20 strength. So I think you'd need to be a berserker, or sorry, a barbarian and rage to even access those from the beginning of the game. Um, maybe you can pick that chest with max lock picking. In any event, you can talk to those noblemen and get them to put their gems upstairs. There's also a plus one dagger you can get from the, the guard who fetches you to get bolts. Um, so there's some minor things like that where it helps to have 18 plus charisma in interactions. But this is really all about buying stuff. Um, uh, the way that buying gear works in Baldur's Gate is that at a charisma of 20, you get a 25% discount. At 14, you have no bonus, and at 20, you have the full 25% bonus. So if you're sitting at 14 Charisma, friends alone, this spell will get you a 25% discount on whatever you're buying. And this does stack with items. So if you take Algernon's Cloak, which gives you plus two, the Tome in the Nolk Cave, which is a permanent uh, plus one to Charisma, the Tome of Leadership and Influence, and friends, then you can add nine to your starting charisma from very early on in BG1. So you could start with 11 charisma and still get maximum store discounts through the use of this spell in early BG1. That's just handy. Uh, it's most handy, er, handy early on when you're not rolling in gold. There's some very powerful items that are available from the very beginning of the game that, uh, that, are, that, that the only gating item the only gating factor to buying is gold you know the robe of the archmagi um the dagger of venom uh the claw of kazgroth if you if you don't mind playing with with cursed items the disruption cloak in that which is sold in olgoth's beard uh which is the the second most powerful cloak in bg1 or the plus three staff that's sold there you know these are expensive items that are very powerful through mid soa um that that the only gating factor is gold and this gets you 25 percent faster to buying them so it just saves a lot of a lot of pain in early and mid bg1 as you get later on in the saga uh you have you can stack up charisma boosting items you'll have npcs with high charisma that can go to the shop so the utility does taper off but I think this spell is a 6 out of 10. I'm rating it a 6 out of 10, which on the rate in my, on my rating scale here is a good spell that has common situational uses. I cast this almost every time I'm doing a big buy at a store, and especially early in BG1, it just makes the game that much faster. It's a good spell at level 1. Next spell, Grease. Grease has a duration of three rounds, plus round one round per level, a casting time of one. So it's, it's an in-combat spell that can be cast quickly. It has a 15-foot radius, and I'll read the description. A grease spell covers a material surface with a slippery layer of fatty, greasy nature. Any creature entering the area or caught in it, when the spell is cast, must save their spell at plus two or slip and slide, unable to move effectively. Those who successfully save can move, albeit slowly, for the rest of the round, but will need to save for a spell again the following round. Those who remain in the area are allowed a saving throw each round until they escape the area. So I'm glad I read that because part of this is not actually accurate. This is those who successfully save can move, albeit slowly, for the rest of the round. That's not true. If enemies inside the area of effect of a grease spell save with their plus two bonus, the spell just has no effect. So this idea that they somehow slow down is not true. If the spell does proc uh, because the enemies save versus spell, then the effect is that it, the spell slows them down as though they're encumbered. It slows down their movement rate. It doesn't, it doesn't incapacitate them. So let's, let's talk about this. I think you have to compare this to the reigning best crowd control spell at level one, which we talked about a bit earlier, even though we haven't officially got to it yet, which is sleep. And when when you do that, you realize this spell is really worse than sleep in, in almost every way. 
Um, the only way in which it's not worse is that it affects creatures that have more than four HD, but you're, you're talking about those creatures needing to fail a save versus spell with a plus two bonus. And that's, it's not going to be many, it's not going to be high probability for level five plus enemies anyway. Why is the spell worse? Well, even if you, if you hit it, it doesn't incapacitate enemies. It just makes them slower. That makes no difference if they're, they're meleeing you. Uh, you know, if you're trying to melee them, making them slower, it doesn't matter. They don't need to move. They get a save each round. So that's worse than sleep. Sleep, if you fail your save, uh, you're just out for five rounds per level. But here there's a save each round. So you have more chances to catch an enemy, but the effect is just so much less devastating because they're gonna be able to get released from the slow movement each round. Obviously ranged enemies and mages are not gonna care. They're sitting there, they don't need to move. They're sitting out of range of melee anyway. Um, and the duration here of three rounds plus one round per level is, is very underwhelming where, when you're at low levels. If you're a level two mage casting this, this is gonna last for five rounds. Sleep would last for 10 rounds if, you, if, if the enemy failed their save, which they're gonna do more often because um, this is at a plus two bonus on save versus spell. So in sum, only reason you'd ever want to use this would probably be to, to make enemies look funny by walking slow. Uh, that's that, that doesn't really score any points on the scale we're going on here. This is a two out of 10 spell. This is a bad spell. If you want crowd control at level one, take sleep. Next up is identify. With this spell memorized, go to the description of an unidentified item and press the identify button. The chance of identifying the item is 100%. The spell identifies the item's name, what it does, and if it is cursed. So this is a, this is a, it, it's, a it's obvious what this spell does. Um, this is a quality of life sort of spell. Um, the power gaming aspect to it is really about saving gold early in the game or when playing solo in a class without high lore. If you don't have identify or access to the identify spell, then it's going to cost you 100 GP at high hedge probably to identify your items. And that can add up. Uh, you're trying to generate gold by selling items. Um, you know, you, you're, you might sell 50 different magical items to, to buy your robe of the Archmagi or your starting gear that you're trying to pick up from the Berigoth Smithy and, and High Hedge. And that's 5,000 gold. So that's not nothing. Um, you can save all that by using this spell. Of course, when you get to, by the time you get to BG2, you'll have party members with high lore. You can buy the Spectacles of Identification, so you never need to memorize this. Um, so. The utility really drops off but i do find myself uh memorizing this spell pretty frequently and using it at low levels throughout throughout bg and maybe beginning of of bg2 just to save the gold the 100 gold per identify which is a ripoff by the way um in sum uh i think this is this is a five out of ten spell it has some utility it's an ease of use spell it's, it's a decent spell. You could definitely play without it, but it's a spell that I find myself using pretty frequently early on to save gold. Next spell in level one is Infravision. Upon the casting of this spell, the recipient gains the ability to see with Infravision just as an elf or dwarf would. This effect lasts for the duration of the spell or until dispelled. No surprises here. I'm rating this a one out of 10. From a power gaming perspective, this does nothing, almost nothing. The only thing that you would ever use it for is that there's a cave in SOD where Infravision is needed to get some mediocre magic items. You need to have a character with Infravision to see uh, a torch that you can light to access a chest. And even in this situation, obviously you, you have a helm and a ring in BG1 that give you 
in provision, so you wouldn't even need to cast this this spell. I did learn testing this out that that the game actually does have a status icon for somebody under the effect of the in provision spell. I feel bad for whatever intern or whoever had to create that useless status icon for this spell. This is a 1 out of 10 spell, one of the worst spells in the game. Almost no use throughout the entire saga. 1 out of 10. Next up, Larlock's Minor Drain. The spell is a casting time of 1, and it affects one creature. It can be any creature. With this spell, the wizard drains the life force from a target and adds it to her own. The target creature suffers 4 damage, while the mage gains 4 hit points. If the mage goes over her maximum hit point total with this spell, she loses any extra hit points after one turn. So this is like a little uh, sort of mini vampiric touch that can be cast at range. I think in the original game, it wasn't a guaranteed 4 hit points, it was 1d4. So the guaranteed four is a little bit better. Um, but looking at this spell, I think, again, for a damage spell at level one, you're comparing to Magic Missile, the gold standard, and you, this just doesn't stack up. There's zero scalability because you're doing four damage at level one and at level 30. Um, and also, uh, when I tested it out, the healing here doesn't stack. So even if you were to cast eight of these things, you would only get four HP. That also really limits the scale the scalability. Maybe if you could cast 10 of these at a high level and add 40 HP, that'd be something to talk about. That'd be worth doing maybe for a fighter mage or something inside an alacrity. But the spell does not work that way. So I'm rating this a two out of 10. Uh, it's arguably, you could say that by a very slim margin, this is your best damage spell if you're at level one or two, right? Because then you have a, only have a single magic missile orb that'll shoot out. Um, but that's that's a that's you're not you're not really you're trying to kill enemies at that level through party members or through your imp familiar. Um, or through wands. You're you're probably using your spells when you only have one or two of them. You're probably doing things like cast shield, um, or you're just running away and letting your familiar and, and party members fight. So obviously level one or two goes by in a blink of an eye as well. There's no other scenario where this is bad, where this is better than magic missile, despite the, the four hit points. Um, and once you get to level three and, and magic missile is doing more damage than this, you never want to use this spell ever again. So 99% of the saga, two out of 10, not a good spell. Next up, we're finally here, magic missile. Casting time of one, targets one creature. Use of the magic missile spell, one of the most popular first level spells, creates up to five missiles of magic energy that dart forth from the wizard's fingertip and unerringly strike their target, which must be a creature of some sort. Each missile inflicts 1d4 plus 1 points of damage. For every two extra levels of experience, the wizard gains an additional missile. She has two at third level, three at fifth level, four at seventh level, up to a total of five at ninth level. I never noticed that the description actually says one of the most popular first level spells. That must have been added by Beamdog or something more recently. I feel like the original game would never try to help you in that way. Um, but it is. This is an iconic spell. This is what I thought of when or the first thing I realized that was cool about being a mage or an arcane magic user when I first played the game 20 years ago. Uh, and it's also the best level one spell. This is just the best level one spell. It's the best damage dealing spell at this level, and it does have some scalability into late game. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that because the, the uses are obvious just based on the description uh, at low levels. So I'll talk a little bit about why this scales well. 
first of all, given the cast time of one, with improved alacrity, you can unload your entire spell book of these things consecutively. You only need Amulet of Power to do so, reducing your spell casting time by one to instant cast this spell. And if you're unloading 10 magic missiles, for example, uh, that's 100 to 250 damage to a single target, an average of 175 damage to that target. That is powerful. Um, that is powerful for a level one spell. Also, the, the, mad the, the damage type here is magic, which is the least resisted damage type in the game. It's the best damage type, um, certainly the best non-physical damage type in the game. So that gives you some scalability. And the last thing that I think is really important is that each of the orbs independently checks for magic resistance. This is a really, really big deal against high level enemies um, that have very high magic resistance. And th there have been many times when I've been fighting against dragons or Demogorgon, um, enemies that you would never think a level one spell would be useful against when it is useful because it's one of the only ways that you can damage those enemies, given that there's no save. And if you have five orbs, you're gonna get five independent checks against magic resistance, uh, which is very helpful. It just increases your odds of doing some damage. And sometimes doing some damage when you have a ton of level one spell spot slots is all you need your mage to do in in a fight so this spell you know for all those reasons um the spell maintains its utility i think uh all the way through the saga it's a great spell the best level one spell and i rate it a nine out of ten it's not game breaking it's not a spell that you get a power spike out of but it's just a very good damage spell and it gives you utility all the way through very very late tob when you're casting it with zero cast time in alacrity next spell protection from evil it lasts two rounds per level you can target one creature including the caster when this spell is cast it creates a magical barrier around the recipient at a distance of one foot. The barrier moves with the recipient and has two major effects. First, all attacks made by evil or evilly enchanted creatures against the protected creature receive a penalty of minus two to each attack roll. Second, summoned demons cannot target the protected creature. So this is a minor buff. Uh, but it does have some scalability in that the duration scales through level 20. So your maximum duration here is 40 rounds or four, or four turns, which is a decent duration. That's, that's maybe a few fights or part of a dungeon. This spell used to be a lot more powerful. It used to grant a plus two bonus to saving throws versus evil as well, which is a nice buff. Um, but... I think the enhanced edition removed this effect and the only impact now is this supposed protection from summon demons which which seems very buggy to me very inconsistent and the enemy penalty to attack rolls which operates the same way as an ac bonus that plus two ac bonus it's not a massive bonus um but there is a place, I think, for this spell because of the decent duration at two rounds per level where by the time you get to uh, sort of mid the saga, somewhere in SOA, and Magic Missile is not as useful, it's worth having maybe one slot of this to give yourself a minor buff that is in a low-cost spell slot. So not bad to have one of these and use it somewhere around the middle of the saga. Early on, Magic Missile is far more powerful, Shield is more powerful, and the duration here, two rounds per level. If you're level four, you're casting it for eight rounds, it's basically one one fight, you know, that's not very good. Of course, if you're playing with as a Cleric Mage 
or you're playing as a party with a cleric, then the cleric versions, including the AOE v versions, are are better than this um, because of what you're giving up to get them. And obviously, AOE is better if you're playing as a party. Um, but this spell does give you something. Uh, even if that thing becomes less and less useful, it does give you something. And for that reason, I'm rating this spell a 4 out of 10. I usually stock um, one of these uh, once, once level gets up and the duration is meaningful, just as a minor buff and because, they're, and because it's worth it to give up one magic missile floor. Next spell at level 1, Protection from Petrification. Duration is 1 hour. It can be cast on anybody, including the caster. This spell grants the recipient immunity to all petrification attacks. This includes Basilisk and Medusa Gaze, Cursed Scrolls of Petrification, etc. So, the spell is pretty simple. It lasts for 1 hour. That's 5 minutes of IRL time and 50 rounds. So this is a long duration for a level one spell, right? I mean, you're, you're getting this at level one. That duration is longer than almost any other level one spell because it's lasting you an hour, even if you're casting it as a level one mage. That never changes. And it can be cast on your entire party if you have, if you have a, a few of them set up. So I think, I think this spell is, it's very difficult to rate this spell because its uses are mostly situational, but they're very powerful um, because of the way the game sets, sets up a couple situations. Um, first of all, there's not really, petrification attacks are rare. Um, basilisks have them, beholders, and mages casting flesh to stone will that those are petrification effects so rare very situational but there's not really um another spell that counters those petrification attacks um certainly not in arcane magic and not from items that i'm aware of uh free action for example does not protect you from petrification so it's it's situational but there's not really a substitution and therefore Combined with the duration, there is some use to this throughout the saga, although situational. The main use for this spell, however, and the reason that I think it's a powerful spell, and I always take it on the character creation screen, is to go level up early in BG1 by making a beeline to the Basilisk area, uh, aka Mutamin's Garden, to the east of the temple, east of Baragost and using this spell to defeat all the basilisks that live there. There are also three greater basilisks on top of Durlag's tower and a lesser basilisk that's, uh, that's on the stairs up to the top of Durlag's tower that can be taken on at early level with this spell. And the reason for that is that basilisks, their ranged attack, all it does is petrify. Um, it's a gaze attack, all it does is petrify. So. From level one, if you stay if you stay ranged, if you stay away from basilisks, even with SCS installed, and you have this spell up, you're going to be immune to their attacks, and you can range them down, kill them with magic missiles, um, tag team them with Korax, the friendly ghoul that's in Mutamin's garden. So this one spell, by itself, uh, allows you to go solo greater basilisks that give you 7k xp per kill if you add up all the basilisks that you can kill from level one of bg using this spell it's about forty thousand xp maybe forty five thousand xp just in those two areas durlag's tower and mutamin's garden that is really powerful that is really powerful to have one level one spell that because of this one very high XP per kill enemy, the Basilisk, can get you 40 to 45k XP from level 1 without any special items or anything else. That's very powerful. For some context, the level cap in the original Baldur's Gate got you as a pure mage through level 7 at around 
80,000 XP. This 45,000 of XP just from using protection from petrification and going and killing some basilisks will take you to level six. So one level below the level cap for the entire game uh, prior to Tales of the Sword Coast. With Tales of the Sword Coast, the 45k XP is still about a quarter of the XP cap through Tales of the Sword Coast. So one level one spell gives you an easy path to basically get a fourth of the way through the game. Get some HP, get up to level two spells, level three spells even, because you're getting to level six. This is, it's, it's situational, but it's extremely useful. And if you're power gaming, this is really the only way that makes sense to start out the game is to go kill these basilisks with, with protection from petrification. So it's very situational, but also very powerful. And there aren't really great alternatives. You can buy potions of mirrored eyes. Um, those are those cost 700 or 800 gold GP per potion. And there's only a few of them, maybe two or three that you can buy from High Hedge. Uh, so you're never gonna be able to kill all the basilisks with just those potions. And on top of that, the potion of mirrored eyes only lasts for 10 rounds compared to uh, an hour of in-game time for, which is five times longer for the spell protection from petrification. So not only does it last longer, but you know, especially with SCS, the second that your protection from petrification wears off, the basilisks know to target you the second that you don't have the, the buff up. So if you're using those potions, it's just very dangerous. 10 rounds goes by very quickly and it's hard to time precisely. I've lost uh, attempted no reload runs many times because I didn't get the exact second that my potion of mirrored eyes ran out and I was trying to maximize the length uh, to kill basilisks. And that second basilisk turns and faces you, launches that gaze attack and you're dead, you can't run, you're probably not gonna make your save, and you're dead. So there's not really a good alternative if you're really trying to minimize your deaths and play safe while you get up to level six to this spell. So in sum, you know, it, it's, a, it's situational, it's a quirk of the game that there's this one enemy, the Basilisk, that uh, gives a lot of XP that makes this spell very powerful, but it is what it is. Those are the rules. Um, and if you're power gaming, you really want this spell and it's very useful to, to start out the game. And, you know, it maintains some utility through TOB. You probably want to have it up when you're fighting beholders, for example, that have that petrification ray. So it's not totally useless after the, the very powerful use case early on in the saga. I give this a six out of 10 rating quality spell. Next spell on the list, Reflected Image. This spell uh, can only be cast by the caster upon himself. It lasts three rounds plus one round per level. The description is short, but I'm not going to read it because this is a really straightforward spell. This is like a mini mirror image. It'll create one mirror image of the caster and the next, uh, the next attack that would do damage to the caster whether it's a magical attack or a physical attack will have a 50 percent chance of hitting the the image and a 50 percent chance of hitting the caster if the attack hits the image then the image goes away and it's gone forever so it's the exact same dynamic as the level two spell mirror image of course this is the level one version and that means you only ever get one image once that image tanks one single hit for you, it's gone forever. So this spell does something, but what it, do, what it does is about the most minute buff that you could imagine. I can't even think, even having one a one bonus to AC would be more significant than this. It takes enemies a fraction of a round to hit you, and it's gonna take you a whole round to cast this. So this is just not a good spell. I was trying to think of ways that you would ever want to take this spell and it does have a short cast time. So maybe there's an argument once you get the amulet of power or Vecna and you throw out 
alacrity, you just include this to add an additional buff because there's no time cost to casting it. But even that doesn't work because ca casting this spell will actually cancel mirror image and vice versa. Mirror imp casting mirror image will cancel this spell. You can't have both of them up at the same time. And if you can only have one or the other, you're always going to choose mirror image, which is much more powerful because it places multiple mirrors around the wizard. So there's really no scenario where this is a good spell. It does something, but the thing it does is incredibly, incredibly minor. I didn't even know this spell really existed until I picked up the scroll for it in the tombs in, in SOA, and I wasn't missing out. Rating, 2 out of 10. Next spell in level 1 is Shield. We talked a little bit about this when we went over the armor spell, um, but now can get into it in a little, a little more detail. So shield lasts for one hour, which is five IRL minutes equal to five turns or 50 rounds in game. That's most of a dungeon or part of a dungeon level. It's uh, a few fights. It's not just one fight. This is a decent duration. It's enough to maybe clear an area in, in BG1 if you're being efficient. And there's a few things this does. Number one, it sets your armor class to four against all melee weapons and two against missile. And then also it grants immunity against magic missile. Now, as I discussed when talking about armor, because this sets base AC, this is much more powerful than a shield that you would equip as a fighter. It actually operates like armor and it sets your it, it's like armor that sets your armor class to four and two against missile weapons that's great i mean that's very that's that's better than the armor spell it's also better than your armor class from which is five from either either robe of the arch magi or vecna which are the only robes you're you're really ever going to want to wear so even with your best armor on through late tob this spell is still giving you a plus one bonus to armor class against all attacks and plus three against missile weapons. So that's good all the way through TOB. And in the early game, uh, you're talking about moving. If you're, if you have, if you're naked or you can't afford arch magi yet, you're talking about moving your base AC from 10 to six, or sorry, 10 to four. So a six bonus. That's huge. That is very huge in a long duration spell. The other thing that, that this spell does is gives you immunity, immunity from magic missiles, which is, I think, probably a, another underrated aspect of this spell. That's really how enemy mages are going to kill you in BG1 and even beginning of SOA. They, they'll, they'll, set, they'll set up their protections, whether it's SCS or not, they'll set up their protections. Then they'll cast some nasty disable or crowd control like um, a whole person or a chaos or confusion or a horror spell and then if you fail your save the way that you're actually going to die to the wizard is the wizard just going to empty his spell book of magic missiles against you I, there have been so many times when my i've been soloing a game and my main my my uh player character has killed all the everything that would do physical damage. There's a mage alive. I'm confused or, or feared by a spell. And then I die because the mage can just cast five magic missiles against me and I'm helpless. This spell pre prevents that outcome. So that that's very powerful. Uh, enemy mages, I think with SCS, they might avoid casting magic missile against you if you're shielded. In the base game, they definitely don't. They'll just cast Magic Missile right into your shield, meaning that they waste a spell round. And this is available from level one. You don't have to wait for Minor Globe. It's available from level one. So this is this is a really uh, nice effect to keep you alive against enemy mages. All in all, uh, a great spell, a very underrated spell. It's got a nice duration of an hour. It's got great utility early on and it still maintains some utility all the way through the end of the saga at TOB. So I'm rating, the, rating this at 7 out of 10. Very good spell. 
Next up is Shocking Grasp. When, it, when the wizard touches a creature while this spell is in effect, an electrical charge will deal 1d8 points of damage plus 1 per level of the caster to the creature touched. In addition, the grasp itself does 1d2 fist damage. Strength bonuses apply. Woo. The wizard only has one charge, and once an opponent has been touched, the spell's energies have been used. If the wizard misses, the spell is wasted. The wizard has one round per level to touch the, car the target creature. Well, a lot of my comments about chill touch and magical weapons are going to apply here. Right off the bat, you know that because this is replacing your main hand weapon with a fist, it's a debuff and it's going to be a bad spell. Full stop. It's going to be it's just a question of how bad. Uh and shocking grasp I, I will it, it is better than chill touch um, simply because you have guaranteed damage, so it's a one-time hit. It doesn't stay up over time, like Chill Touch. Um, you still have to make your attack, but if you do make your attack, the opponent doesn't get a save and is going and is going to get hit with that one d8 plus uh, plus one per level of the caster in electrical damage. This maxes out at level 20, so at level 20, you're doing one d8 plus 20 electrical damage with this spell. Just a bad spell. It's just a bad spell. Uh, you know, maybe if you're having fun and you have a low Thacko uh, at level 20 or above and you want to do a bit more damage than a magic missile, then you could cast this spell and you would have a chance to do more damage. You would likely do more damage than a magic missile. Um, but you'd have to get within melee and you'd be eliminating your main hand weapon and all the buffs that went with it. So even there... Um, not a good spell. Bad spell, rating 2 out of 10. Barely better than Chill Touch. Next up is Sleep. We've talked a lot about this spell in the context of discussing um, Color Spray and the other Disables at this level. Uh, so I don't need to spend a lot of time. Uh, you know, the basics of this, it, it goes out in a 15-foot radius. You have a saving throw versus death with the minus three penalty, as discussed before, or the enemies will fall asleep. And while asleep, they're sleeping for five rounds per level, and every attack against those enemies will hit them. This only works on enemies that are 4 HD or below. So generally, level four or below enemies. I hear a lot of buzz about the sleep spell and people talking about how useful it is. It is party friendly. Um, in my view, I'd always rather take a magic missile and actually do damage and get closer to ending the fight. I think there's very few enemies that are 4 HD or below that are actually scary uh, by definition. And you probably don't need disables to kill those types of enemies, especially because if you're using this spell, you're probably running a group. Uh, you're not playing solo and you probably have some fighters in your group and any group of fighters is going to do very well against 4HD and below enemies at basically any level. Um, so I think there's just better ways to kill enemies early on. For example, you're better off using the imp and having the imp polymorph into mustard jelly and just be completely immune to enemies' attacks. I think that's more effective than, than having a chance to put some enemies to sleep. And of course, the spell has absolutely zero scalability past early to mid BG1 because of the 4 HD limit. So I'm still rating this a 3 out of 10. I just find I don't use this spell very often because enemies that it could possibly affect that would fail their save and are 4 HD or below, or below are just very weak enemies that there are a million ways to kill. Wand of Fire, um, Magic Missile or melee if you're paying, playing in a party without worry, worrying too much about these enemies um, killing you. So 3 out of 10. Not a great spell, in my view. Better than Color Spray. Not, not enough better to be rated a 4. Finally, that leaves us with the last spell in level 1. That is Spook. 
Spook is a single target disable. It's like a single target horror spell. The duration is three rounds. I'll get back to that. It's a very short duration. Casting time of one, so it can be cast quickly. And just the one interesting thing about this spell is, is the saving throw dynamic. I'll just read that part of the description. The creature suffers a saving throw penalty of minus one every two levels of the caster, up to a maximum of minus six at 12th level. So the enemy's chance to save against this will decline as you get, I guess, scarier uh, and higher up in level. Um, and by the time you're 12th level, you're going to have a majority chance of this spell working and sending the single target fleeing, assuming that the target's not immune to fear, which un all undead are, and many enemies that you face will will have um, items or spells up that, that protect them from fear, especially after, after BG1. After BG1, your odds of fearing most enemies are not going to be vulnerable to this at all. Um, I think the problem, the problem with this, I mean, just comparing it to even other things at this level, it's single target and the duration is three rounds and there's still a save. So I just can't really see using this. Uh, you're going to take one enemy out of the fight for three rounds, which is not, which is not really long enough to, um, to end most fights. So you're still gonna have to deal with that enemy once you're done. While feared, the enemy is not going to get any penalty to AC or anything, and certainly it's not going to be an auto hit like, like sleep or color spray would be, and it's single target, um, so just not not too much utility, and there's definitely an annoyance factor of instead of uh, sleep or stun spells like web, or color spray etc. where you're holding your enemies in place the spooked enemy will run all over the screen, meaning that you're probably not even going to be able to get off attacks against them for the whole three rounds that they're spooked. Just not a very good spell. The bonus to saves seems nice, um, but by the time you're level 12, your magic missile's doing an average of 18 damage per shot. Even your chromatic orb at by level 12, you have a chance to just kill. Um, you know, at level 12, your 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 other level one spells are good enough. You don't want to be taking this even with the penalty to saves. So this concludes the level one arcane spell guide that I put together. Uh, I'm just going to put up here the final ranking or where I rate all the various spells in level one. Level one, although the weakest spells in the game. There are some strong spells in here that have utility all the way through TOB. The big three being Magic Missile, Find Familiar, and Shield. And then below that, there's a few situational spells that are that are helpful, especially earlier on in the saga. So a quality spell level overall. If you have any comments, let me know. I'd love to get alternative thoughts on this, let me know where I screwed up, where I didn't get something right, where I didn't think of, about a way that a spell could be used. Uh, I, I think that stuff, I'm sure I don't know enough about the game to have gotten everything right or seen every angle. And I love, um, I love hearing about ideas that other people have for how to use spells or what's good or not. So let me know. Thanks for watching.